I'll read our little um, intro, um, allowing a Zoom meeting while and see if more people filter into the waiting room while I do that. So, hello everybody. As chair of the Rochester Select Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by Governor Scott as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and pursuant to Addendum 6 to Executive Order 01-20, and Act 92, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. And in accordance with Act 92, there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the temporary amendments to the open meeting law, I confirm that we're providing public access to the meeting using the Zoom platform. And you can, here's somebody else that wants to get in there. And you can get access to that by either going to the town website to the, be the um, connectivity um, pathways or look at the posted minutes around town or request a direct email invite from the town clerk. And that's um, so we'll just, and that's, um, is that you, Danny, in, in Manzanita? That just entered? Yeah, I'm going to mute. And Nancy's going to be here too. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> and so we have, I think everyone, there's no mysterious phone number identities. So um, I think that we can move forward. Welcome everyone. You know what this is about. This is a, um, basically a hearing about the application on the town is submitting on behalf of the committee that is uh, researching the options for repurposing the high school building. And we have Vic and Catherine here as representatives of that committee that can really present um, what this grant application entails and what it's asking for. And um, I think that I will let them take it away from here. Okay, uh, thanks, Dune, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'll give a few comments about the grant application, what it's for, and Catherine will add to that. And then I think we'll just open it up to comments, questions. It's, it's uh, to take public comment. And uh, as questions come up, we'll try to answer them uh, as best we can. And uh, and just, uh, you know, go as long as people want to uh, talk. So, um, just, just again, to be clear, this, this uh, hearing is about the grant application. It is not about a decision for the town to either acquire or not acquire uh, the high school building. Uh, it's purely about uh, this uh, grant proposal that the town is gonna submit to do a, a feasibility study on um, some um, program uh, concepts for the, for the building. It's a $58,000 request. It's going to the uh, the Vermont uh, Community Development Program, which is a program of the Agency of Commerce and Communication of the state. The, the source of money is the uh, Federal Department of, of uh, Housing and Urban Development and then flows through the state and then to the uh, successful applicants. So, so the money, uh, that's, that's the source of the funding. It's really, it's to provide a uh, feasibility study um, and that is uh, the purpose of which is to enable the town, uh, meaning both the select board and the, the voters of the town, uh, to uh, evaluate if and how the, 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 what would be the most effective use of the, uh, of the high school building um, uh, with, a, with a newer purpose. So uh, it involves um, a project uh, proposal that is cited in the uh, in the application itself, if you had an opportunity to uh, read it, it's on the town website and, and it's spelled out in, in quite a bit of detail there. But just quickly to summarize, uh, it's to uh, meet identified local and, and regional needs more than just the town of Rochester, but really the Quintown area and in some cases even beyond uh, for child care, adult daycare, um, enhance the economic development and the creative economy through the creation of a maker space. Uh, and uh, what we're calling an arts and learning center, as well as uh, support other complementary uses that uh, the community uh, needs and would uh, we feel benefit from. Um, so um, the, the actual work itself, the, the $58,000 is to be spent on consulting services uh, where uh, uh, experienced consultants uh, 
who know and have done feasibility work like this would be engaged to prepare a master site, uh, uh, master plan for the building itself, would assess the physical uh, condition and uh, improvement requirements to meet the, uh, the needs of the programs that are intended for the repurposed building and, and uh, do an overall operating budget for those set of programs. You know, what would the revenue look like? What would the expense look like? Uh, at the bottom line, would it break even? Would it not? If not, by how much? Um, and to assess possible funding sources uh, for those, uh, uh, for those uh, improvements to the building, as well as uh, if, there's a, if a deficit is determined. So um, that's, in a nutshell, the, the work that would be uh, uh, conducted uh, in, the, in the scope of this uh, feasibility study. Um, in addition to those identified needs, uh, there are, are or may be other needs that will pop up during the course of the study, and, and uh, we can take a look at those as well. Uh, the uh, 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 one idea that has been uh, suggested to us from the uh, Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation is to take a look at uh, housing. That is a uh, that is a, a clear need uh, in all parts of Vermont, and uh, they've asked us to, to take a, a look at housing, uh, low-income housing as an option as well. But uh, that's not within the scope of what we have intended to propose in the, in the, the grant, but uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that too. Catherine? Well, um, this, uh, as, as Vic said, the, uh, the most recent draft is, uh, has been posted on the town website. It is a rather dense document of 26 pages, but it follows the specific questions asked of the planning grant. And um, it's been really a year, uh, with the exception of a few months of the shutdown of the COVID, uh, where we were, um, our attention was elsewhere, uh, of many people from the community engaging in, in various uh, Zoom meetings, even some uh, face-to-face uh, focus group meetings over the summer, masked, socially distanced. Um, we, um, I think it's the consent, I know it's the consensus of everyone who has worked on this project and who's responded by email to the, to the email account that we set up early on, is that the, the building itself has enduring significance beyond being a public high school as a place for intergenerational activities and social engagement and learning. And I think you'll find that the proposal, the five components of that composal literally align with this. Um, we, the committee has all felt that we still wanna keep the, um, the wing of the building that houses the auditorium, which is the only, audit, the only auditorium space like that in the entire Quintown area with a 300 plus capacity rec, uh, amphitheater uh, seating there is no other facility like that around and we want to keep that uh, accessible to the to the school district as well. So um, we don't have everything figured out, which is why we want the feasibility study. We feel that it's important to have the professional consultants to do a well researched assessment of everything so that the town can have factual information as much as possible to be informed to vote on whether or not the town should acquire the building. So again, as Vic said, this is not tonight about acquiring the building. It's about getting the planning grant money to do the assessment to decide whether we're gonna acquire the building. Because um, even though it's, it's, it could be ours for a dollar, we wanna make sure that it's not a gift that keeps on taking, which I know that um, some folks uh, are concerned about. So we wanna make sure that it remains a town asset and one that can pay for itself. Uh, and uh, we've got several members of our committee here uh, who could speak to their specific thing. Um, Dick, would you like to talk to the makerspace or Robert? Uh, Jeff has been involved in the energy assessments uh, and Dorothy and some other people have been on the arts and learning committee. So please feel welcome to jump in and talk about how you uh, envision how the this multi-use facility is uh, going to be a benefit to whatever has been your focus of interest in the months that we've all worked together. Robert. Um, 
Uh, I, before we, we go off into that, I'd, I'd like uh, uh, Vic and Catherine to speak to two points. One is matching grant. I mean, the, the, what, what we have to have for a match for the grant mm -hmm. and two, how this aligns with the town and regional plans. Okay, I, I can speak to the first point. There's a 10% a required matching grant. So $58,000 is the amount of funds we're seeking. So $5,800 match which can be in cash or in kind service uh, or any combination of the two. So what we're proposing to the agency is a $2,000 cash match plus uh, $3,800 in valued volunteer time uh, match. And they, they value volunteer time. I didn't realize it was this valuable, but it's $25 an hour is the rate that they credit volunteer time. And uh, we would do the, the $2,000 would come from a community fundraising match. It would not come from the town budget or reserve funds, anything of that nature. There's also a small amount of in-kind service, I think it's less than $1,000 of uh, Joan Allen's time um, uh, as part of a, a contribution, again, in-kind service that's not new expenditure for the town. And, and the second point about uh, how it fits in with the town and and regional plans. All right. So I can I can speak to the town plan. Um, okay. We uh, we went through it on Tuesday night, um, and the planning commission found all of the proposed uses uh, consistent with with our vision, with both 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 the plan and the zoning. And the chair of the planning commission is writing a letter to that effect. Uh, with respect to the regional plan, um, the um, we had we had some help from. Um, the uh, uh, Council on Rural Development, um, and they went through the regional plan and it's consistent and we're getting a letter as well from the Regional Planning Commission. And that's, and those are covered in items number seven and number eight in the grant document. And those letters will be attached. We're, the letters are still trickling in, but they are coming in. I mean, I could quote to you from that. Is that what you want, Robert? Uh no, I just wanted a, um, a overview on it. So, Dick, would you like to speak to the uh, makerspace? Uh, sure. So, um, a makerspace is a facility that uh, would probably be uh, a membership uh, facility where uh, anybody from the community can come and use uh, tools and uh, instruction uh, to make whatever. Uh, that the hope would be that it would have woodworking, metalworking, um, electronics lab, um, uh, facilities like 3D printers and con uh, computer controlled uh, routers, things like that, uh, that uh, people can learn to use that and the further hope is that there might be a connected um, business incubator space where somebody who is trying to set up a business, uh, whether they use the maker space or not um, for prototyping or small production, but a space where uh, there would be shared um, office equipment and uh, low cost uh, space so that they can get uh, going on a, a business. So we're, we're hoping that this would be a facility that would uh, attract people from the community who are just looking to learn how to make things, want to meet other people who are making things, but that it'll also be a draw, a uh, business draw, and that it also uh, could be used by the school uh, in its STEM programs uh, where they could come use tools, use things like 3D printer and so forth. And, and there is uh, a lot of equipment in the present wood shop, uh, which would be uh, wonderful if, if the high school building can retain those things. And we already have uh, some donations of equipment for that use. I would like to say that, you know, this isn't just pie in the sky. We're actually modeling a lot of our plans on the uh, uh, Mint, uh, which is a makerspace in Rutland. 
and not only have they survived the um, pandemic, uh, although they took a big hit, they are already, uh, I just was reading on their website, they've expanded, expanded their space. So they're, they're in a growing mode. Uh, it's a good indication that um, um, uh, you know, it's a, a very feasible project. I guess it's just a question of how many people we could attract. They have a very uh, a vibrant program where they use, where they have businesses who come are, are making products using the, using the equipment. And this is something that they encourage. Uh, so there's there are, uh, I, um, there are several businesses, including one business that has all has placed all their uh, a whole large room full of um, equipment down there to um, and and they use it for the business, but also share it with the facility. So you know there's there's a lot of potential in in that sort of shared use. Um, not only for private individuals, but for businesses. They also have an entrepreneurial program. Uh, so that helps people interested in startup business um, in a mentoring process. The, I think the intergenerational education aspect of this proposal uh, is what makes it very exciting because adult education is not so easily available around here and this could truly potential you know provide that opportunity uh, for the region so um, the other thing with the co-working spaces uh, that the building that was empty for so long across from the chef's market in randolph that they've turned themselves into co-working and they have 17 units and they only four available so that's a very encouraging sign about the, uh, you know, the popularity of that kind of co-working space. And as, as Rochester becomes increasingly, you know, a recreation des destination, the, the idea of even having a potential, what they call the passport program, where people who are doing the, uh, exploring the natural resources across the state when they come to Rochester to be able to have some sort of a, an office space available to them so that they're, I mean, uh, it, not only accommodations for, for, for overnight, but, but office accommodations. So we're exploring all the, you know, the possibilities with that kind of space that will certainly help economic development. Laura, do you wanna talk about childcare? I do. I was going to say that's a good spot for me to jump in and talk about what we are doing with our early child care group. Um, I'm the preschool teacher at Rochester Elementary School. For those of you who don't know me, I work with Burley Griffith. Um, I've been there for seven years. So I know a lot of the young families in town and I know the grandparents and the need of the young families. And being in Rochester for a number of years. I've been there during the time that the high school building was closed too. Um, but I have a draw to do something in that space. And because I do, a couple years ago, I met with the fire marshal to see what he would approve as space that would support an early child care program. So I know from him where he would say, this is where occupancy would be granted without much having to happen to the space which is the first real step when you open up a childcare. So knowing that space was encouraging, but then we had to pause things. And so now that we're in a new part of being able to soon hopefully go into the high school building and do new things, we've made some steps with forming a childcare board for this new childcare. Caden Hamlin is on it, myself, Burley Griffith, and Michaela Richardson, a preschool parent and a business owner. So having come together, we are now a nonprofit childcare because knowing the childcare world, you want to be a nonprofit so you can receive the most grants as a childcare, which will give to sustainability of the business because a childcare is great, but there's also the business side of it that needs to be considered. To see what the real need is, we've put out a survey to the local population, which yielded very positive results. So we know that immediately opening, we would have a full classroom 
for, we were first thinking of after school for preschool children, because I know that there's that need immediately. For state money, where the state has money for grants is for toddler and infant spaces, because those are so difficult to find across the state, anywhere you go. So we would look to open up with a after school preschool program and have toddler care during the day. And as the need continues to grow, we could expand hopefully, but that's where we are right now. So when things are further along, we can move along with them. But right now we're just in full support of this grant to get to the next step. We've also gotten a letter of support from the One Planet um, out of the supervisory union. They conduct the, um, the summer programs as well as the after school and they're very supportive and wanna be involved in this as well. So, and I feel that, you know, having these facilities all under the same roof will have a mutual benefit. To have an arts and learning center with a childcare and adult care will give a potential for expanding the programs of those facilities. Um, Lauren and I spoke, and I think uh, the whole childcare group spoke about you know, the idea of really, Reggio Emilia, for anybody who knows that philosophy, this incredible childcare program that came out of Reggio Emilia, Italy, which really brought the arts into the core of the learning process. So exciting, incredible work. And they are also excited and aligned with that. So it just, it just to me, just seems like there is incredible potential at a time when our school budgets for the arts is shrinking. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really that we're offering what is not necessarily as available uh, through the public school system. Robert, you have... You're muted, Robert. Yeah, you're muted. I'm sorry, uh, would yeah. you, Lauren, would you speak to the uh, previous experience with childcare uh, facilities that mem members of your group have? Sure. Um, I have taught at Rochester for seven years. I also run my own child care business in Plymouth during the summers. Um, and at that facility, it's at the old Plymouth Elementary School. So I've been through the process where an old school gets converted into a community center. Um, Burley has worked with me for four years and has achieved his associate's degree since working in Rochester and is committed to the early education field. And to have a male in early education is very rare <laughs> and wonderful. Um, I'll let Kaden speak to where she is at with her career in childcare. I think she's better at that. Thank you. Um, I am a licensed early child or a certified early childhood educator and I have previously been a preschool teacher for two years. So like Lauren has experience of the wazoo um, in comparison, but I, um, I have experience in childcare. Um, I'm also pursuing um, an, early, uh, an elementary ed degree and I have a little bit left, so yeah. Um, Robert Gardner, I thought, do you wanna say something? You're muted. There we go. You hear me? Yeah, you know we do. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I wasn't signaling that I did. Oh, I thought you're just scratching your head. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm okay. All right. Okay. Just I saw your the two Roberts at the either end of my screen that put their hands up at the same time. Really? Yeah. Martha, you have something you want to say? Um, I just wanted to comment that I think that that uh, of all the many uses for the building, that is one in particular that um, I'm very much in favor of. I think it it could be not only um, a wonderful asset for the young families already in town who need childcare help, but it could be a way to attract more young families to town, knowing that there's something like a facility like this available. Um, speaking as someone who moved here 36 years ago with three very young kids, one of whom was just turned one, um, I did use take care of uh, take advantage of using dandelion daycare uh, for my younger one in particular, and it was a godsend to me and to many other young families. So I'm just thinking that this could be, like I said, a way to not only help the ones that are here, but attract others, you know, um, and we don't want our population to shrink and it's wonderful to have young families with young kids. 
Um, which, actually, which actually brings up the other aspect, of which is the, the other end of the age demographic is the, you know, adult daycare. So being a longtime um, advocate and case manager for the Central Mont Council of Aging with an office right here in Rochester, gosh, 24 years last month, that's too long. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I can speak very, very candidly to the elder demographic of which many of us are actually approaching it and, um, and, and the challenges of long-term care. Uh, I have uh, a very large, what they call Choices for Care, that's the long-term care program in uh, the state of Vermont, which pays for long-term care on a home-based waiver or in some sort of a, a residential facility. Uh, but all of my clients are at, in the community receiving their services at home. And one of the biggest challenges for caregivers is a daytime care, not just sitting them in front of a television set, but actually providing mentally challenging activities and social engagement. And again, uh, transportation is a big deal. There's one, you know, there's a room literally up in Bethel where the, the Bethel Rite Aid is, uh, which is a, a large room that's been run by a wonderful person, Judy Santamore, a nurse for years. Of course, all the adults say is closed down during the pandemic, but they've been waitlisted for over a year. And one of the biggest challenges is actually transportation from this valley over there. So I do think that we could definitely, you know, have a, a very viable uh, adult daycare. Uh, and we, and Molly and I are developing that. And we're actually looking for, in a similar situation, to find somebody or, or an organization that's already licensed who wants to come into our facility as a tenant. Lolly, you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, I, I, the idea of doing a senior um, daycare facility, I think resonates pretty strongly with a lot of people around here. I think the population is definitely here. Um, I think the idea of it being um, located within this multi-use facility um, would make it incredibly unique and probably pretty desirable to a lot of people um, in the sense if there are art classes going on or theater or just other activities for, um, for people to be involved in. Um, I do think that uh, there, there are a number of adult daycares across the state and they did close down for the pandemic. There have been quite a few that closed permanently um, but they are mostly, the ones that are surviving are mostly nonprofits. Um, and I do think there's probably the best case scenario would be to um, uh, partner up with um, someone who's already running one, could open up a second location here, um, that type of thing. And the good news is there's lots of money coming in from the state of Vermont going into adult day and from um, the, um, the federal government funds for the elder care. So that's kind of an optimistic picture right now. So, so that brings us to arts and learning and we have uh, a very strong um, and long established arts community in this valley. And they are independent and and uh, operating fine. Yes, they've been creative through the <laughs> pandemic. Uh, and we really, and we, and they, and leadership from all the arts organizations have been part of these committees. And uh, the strong feeling is for those that have been accessing and using the building, like the White River Valley Players for since 1974, really or 1979 when they were established, but they were doing high school uh, productions since the building actually opened, that they have a long established use. They've maintained uh, that auditorium after Irene, they actually led uh, the, uh, the repair and upgrade of that auditorium. And Dorothy, you wanna to speak to that? Sure. Um, I was the first music teacher when that building opened in 1974. I was the K-12 vocal music teacher and was one of the 
two music teachers using that room and seeing the joy and excitement on the faces of everyone coming in to the brand new building. So it's, it's kind of, um, I don't know, hard to fathom that the building could be, it, the life of the building could be coming to an end. I think that's, that's hard for me to, to kind of swallow. Um, the players have been in existence for 42 years and five years before that, um, yes, there were some high school productions that filled the auditorium. It was back when pretty much the only thing to do with teenagers could do would be athletics, which is wonderful, but it wasn't necessarily what everybody was um, going to succeed in. Um, some of you know that Mrs. Kirkpatrick, who was a longtime benefactress of the town, gave the money for the auditorium. We would not have had it had it not been for her generosity. And Dean Martin played a vital part in helping to make that gift um, a reality. Um, Yes, Catherine spoke to our investment in the technical and the equipment, um, the systems in the auditorium. It, it was given, it was built with a very, very basic um, set of equipment. And over the years, the players have invested money and skill in maintaining and bringing it up to more professional standards. And then going on to what the building could become for the Arts and Learning Center. I really like the term, the hub. Whoever came up with that, I, I really like that. And I can envision professional summer theater just loving to be in that facility. And to think what professional summer theater brings to a town. You think about Weston and Dorset and some of these places that have um, just, the, has benefited the town great, greatly. Thinking about Suzuki, which is there in the summertime, hopefully building on that, there could be more music lessons that are taught from that building. It has practice rooms, it has facilities that are great for uh, teaching individual or group lessons. It's also a fabulous community gathering place. And I think we're all longing to gather as a community. We've really um, been missing that. And uh, the auditorium is a gathering place. The whole building brings people together. Um, uh, just two more things. One is uh, in the past, there have been arts organizations that create their own original works. I can see more and more of that happening, especially uh, works that might include some part-time residents, artists who have um, vacation homes here who could be working with local people and <clears throat> teaching us and i'm sure they might learn a couple things from us i don't know but just the mix of people i i really see that as a as a really positive thing that could happen and i think the sun is going to uh, make me <laughs> go into the shadows over here i think that's all i have to say Thank you. Uh, Leslie, you want to jump in from Rochester? Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, a few things. Um, for those who don't know, I'm with the, the Chamber Music Society um, that's been in town. This is our 27th season. And um, we, we typically perform, have our performances in the church. And it's just, uh, it's just a very, you know, a small chamber uh atmosphere and also we don't charge for our concerts so um the church um pretty much stipulated use the space but don't charge so it's by donation and it ensures that anybody in town and can come to a concert and not have to spend money um and we're talking you know world-class artists often and and you it doesn't cost anything, it's just a donation. But um, some of the ideas, I mean, we would envision more residencies. We had a string quartet come and join us for uh, summers for many years and we provided them housing and they worked up their program that they would take on the road during the year and then they would perform that program for us. Um, I see other residencies, we did one uh, about two years ago in Pierce Hall where the musicians came and spent many days 
So we see that kind of opportunity and I see a different kind of residency of, of different mediums. Um, Dune and Annie are doing a little hostel uh, building and I think of, you know, having artists come who might be given the grant to, to be here for 30 to 60 days and work on, you know, whatever is projects they, they want to work on. Um, we love to work with children and adults and collaborative music making over the years. There's been a lot of those opportunities, bringing in instructors, doing uh, simple adult uh, youth um, ensembles. Um, but I, I, uh, I also want to just mention Suzuki is the one week camp that runs um, under our CMS. Um, the original director for um, Suzuki for many years was an economist, and she did a survey. You know, if you don't know anything about Suzuki training, the parent is involved, and the parent is always in the master class and takes notes. So they come as families. They love to come to Rochester. Teachers come from across the country. They love to sit in the river at four o'clock with their colleagues from around the country. But Jody, the original um, director, determined that it brought about fifty thousand dollars, you know, into the valley. Now you're talking about people needing housing. So there was a campground, there was the Hancock Hotel, there was a uh, great bonnet. So the people are spread out. Um, now there's a lot of Airbnb, so they're in different houses. Um, we have to put staff up in houses. So Suzuki is a little economic driver for the week that it is here. Um, and it's used this building for a long time and we hope to continue that. And it could be the model for other sort of residencies as well. Yeah, without the building, they would have to move on. Robert, you want to say something? You're, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, I also would like to point out that we're not just talking performing arts. Uh, there's some potential for uh, good collaboration in other types of, of arts, um, you know, is looking at other maker spaces and there's, uh, 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 there's potential for um, things like um, uh, um, a, a stained glass, uh, window making, there's uh, uh, arts include involving welding, there's arts involving um, uh, pottery, which is also down at the, there's equipment down at the school for that, um, and and also woodworking. So the the potential for the arts and learning to collaborate with the um, makerspace and that whole wing of the, of the um, high school is, there's a great, great potential there. And I understand you have 48 people who have shown that they're interested in to, to participate in a makerspace program. Yes, and about, uh, I've forgotten the number of those, uh, 12 are willing to do things like classes and such. So that was an immediate response just through a, a, a fairly quick uh, uh, outreach. So, um You've touched on a lot of the, the opportunities and the, and the people that are um, have energy behind driving those opportunities. Does anyone else have anything that they they questions for the the drive, Robert? Yeah, I think first of all, the idea of a of a of grant a study like this is extremely good and useful, and I applaud everyone's hard work in bringing it together. Uh, it's an essential idea, really good idea. Uh, I have a couple of areas of discomfort. If, if you look at the list of proposed uh, items in the proposal, seven of them, only two of the seven in, in my eyes have any potential for bringing money in at all. And one of the reasons, of course, the school board in Stockbridge want to get out from under this building is because of the cost of maintaining it and the cost of uh, energy uh, uh, to keep it heated and electricity and whatnot. Uh, my sense in listening to the conversation here today and also in this, the tone of the proposal is that the dark side, that meaning the cost of this stuff, the potential liability of the town is not in the foreground. And I know, and, and Dune, you can stop me if I start coloring outside the lines, but I, I know that we're talking about the proposal, but the proposal and this conversation in a way is setting the tone 
and the expectations of the community for what this place is going to be or whatever, how, how to frame the, the dialogue about, about what direction it might take. And I think that if we don't take a very serious, realistic, hard look at the potential liabilities to the town that this project has, we are doing a disservice to the voters. I think everything sounds great. All the ideas are, they're wonderful. I love, I love them all. Child, it all sounds great, but it comes down to dollars and cents. The town cannot afford to carry this, and that should be very clear. But rather than being the heavy in this, uh, I thought I would ask um, Vic, because he and I have talked about this, to step up and really talk about the downside of this, or, or, or rather than the downside, the realistic liabilities and costs of a project like this. Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, just coming back to the notion of feasibility, it's feasibility in terms of the economics of it as well as, you know, programmatically, is there enough demand in the Valley or Valley Plus to, to make the programs uh, viable? So the, 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 the uh, economic uh, uh, risks or challenges are boil down to basically two things. One is operating expense for the building, that is heat, electricity, uh, shoveling the snow, uh, keeping the building clean, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, that could be very expensive, uh, no doubt about it. So from an operating, you know, that's something that has to be paid for every year. Uh, and on the capital side, I think as probably everybody on this call recognizes that the building has a lot of deferred maintenance. So the heating system, the ventilation, the roof, all of that um, has a uh, need for repair or replacement at some point in time. And part of the uh, the um, feasibility study is to look at and, and identify what are the um, uh, what aspects of the building should be uh, addressed upon initial usage, what's going to be needed to be done in five years, what's going to need to be done in 10 years, and put real numbers to that, uh, and uh, where the money might come from to, uh, to pay for that. Uh, you know, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, or, or more, or well beyond that. Uh, but again, it depends on the, the, uh, the actual use of the building. So uh, our intention is to come up with, our, our hope <laughs> is to come up with a plan and, and hopefully the, the feasibility will, will help guide the way in terms of how to get there, uh, where the building can be self-sustaining uh, through a combination of user fees, grants, uh, donations, uh, and and uh, you know that it all come together. Uh, so uh, it is uh, as, as Rob is alluding to. It's it's not something to be taken lightly, and I don't think anybody on the committee does take it lightly. I mean, Jeff, for example, has been looking at the energy costs, and and you know they're significant. There's no question about it. It's not an energy efficient building by any means, and uh, you know. But fortunately, there are grant grant sources out there to. Uh, Help address a lot of the things we're talking about. So, um, but you know, there is there is significant economic risk, but there's also opportunity uh, to address those risks through uh, funding sources that come from outside the valley, as well as you know, uh, generous contributions uh, from individuals uh, in the area. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that this conversation tonight is about applying for a grant to study those very issues and to try and really nail down some dollars and cents and and and, and identify the in the clear light of of, of uh, paid research you know what what can how it all filters out yeah rob does that address your question or is there more that you'd like me to speak to on that uh i thought you might want to put the, the uh, yearly figure with oh. all right jeff Oh, I wasn't going there, but uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, it's hard to tell what it is. I only went back to the 2016-2017. Uh, That's the oldest. 2017 was the oldest fiscal year. Um, the next year, both of those years were roughly $68,000 for energy costs in the building, electricity and, and uh, heating fuel. Um, you know, I have great concerns about the quality or the performance of the building, its costs and operations. Uh, I was a school board chair for Rochester in the 90s for 60, for six years. Felt like 60 years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm well aware of, of uh, how hard it was to get maintenance done on that, improvements done on that. Robert and I remember three tries at a budget in order to get the boiler fixed and uh, and that was with matching money. 
But we have a building that we can't just ignore or it will become like another large building up in Hancock. Um, so I am really hoping that the folks on the, uh, on a lot of the program side are finding things that can help us with the cost of operations in that building simultaneous to looking at energy use in our public buildings across the board here in town and, and seeing what we can pull in from Efficiency Vermont, from grants, and from volunteer work in this community uh, to, to make this happen. I'm hoping that we can utilize the full, full school. Um, we know from the Black River design that their uh, analysis of it is that there are other ways to save parts of it and to take and remove other parts. So, you know, I think this feasibility study is really important. And one of the other things I understand that it would do is also, if it finds things feasible, start looking for the next grant level for implementation, design or implementation, what have you, and move from there. So I, I've got very big worries about the building. It's not an easy one to really improve, um, but uh, we've got to do something or we're gonna wind up with a mess there. So um, um, Frank, Severi, and then Dick, if you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, will, the, will the grant look at other alternatives? Not just if some of these things don't, uh, don't pan out, um, can we, do we, does the grant cover things like a two third rising of the place and maybe keeping the auditorium and, and consolidating some of the town properties, like maybe disposing of the town office and moving that to that building instead? I mean, I think it, that that grant should look at alternatives such as that, because if some of these things aren't feasible, then I think we should move in a direction where we might have to think about what we need to do as a town mm -hmm. um, to consolidate some. We've got an old firehouse, our town garage is sitting in the, on the river. We've got the town office that is gonna require a lot of maintenance down the road. And maybe you know that kind of thing might be in order if some of these things don't pan out. I, I think that formally, uh, that would fall outside the scope of the grant because the purpose of the, the grant is to is to assess a potential use of the building, uh, not a a uh, you know, potential for demolition or or uh, uh, you know from that standpoint. Uh, and I think that within the scope, if we want to look at, as you say, you know, other uses uh, like uh, you know for the town garage or something, I think that would be possible we could look at that and as i said in the there's a, we have a sort of a catch-all paragraph in the proposal that says other uses that would be compatible with the with the building the program would be looked at as well um and uh you know so i think that, that could be looked. but our 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 mission was to come up with a, a use of the building that would be consistent with the uh, uh, benefit to the community and so that's what we've been working on uh, I know there is a, uh, a cost estimate for demolition of total or half of the building in the Black River study. Uh, and, you know, if someone wants to pursue that and, and you know, tighten up on the numbers, uh, that, that could be done, but I don't think that would be consistent with the purpose of this grant. I understand, I understand the notion of, you know, a larger scope look at all the potential outcomes of the building, but within this grant per, uh, per se, that would be outside the scope of the grant. So, um, Daddy, do you Dick, want to Dick, Robson, Dick Robson had his hand up earlier, Sorry. and then um. yeah, I, I would just like to say that we, we can't lose sight of the fact that this would be an investment in the future of this valley. That just like our schools are investments in the future, uh, schools do not pay for themselves but we say that they, they will in terms of our general population over the lives of the people who go through those schools. So if we provide some place in this valley that draws people here, people who 
come from other communities to use it, people who want to move here because it exists. These are things that you can't, you can't put in the budget, but they are very important things in the life of a valley that doesn't have a lot going for it, other than we love it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Robert, Mary, you had a comment you wanted to make? Yeah, and mute again. Uh, Dick addressed the point for me. Okay. And Pat, did you have your hand up earlier? Pat Harvey? Well, I just wanted to say that um, we are working within the scope of this planning grant on uh, doing discovery and feasibility about this particular aspect of what could possibly happen with the building. Um, that's what this hearing is doing. It's, it's addressing this one particular avenue we could take. That doesn't mean that we are not pursuing other avenues. Um, we are starting to pursue another avenue tomorrow morning. Some of these avenues don't really need a whole lot of um, discovery, expo exploration. Uh, they would be kind of cut and dry um, if we were to um, decide to sell the building, well, we don't have to do an entirely long research planning process for that. This particular one is the one that is the most in depth um, for obvious reasons. It's, it's very multi complex and multifaceted. Um, and, and others are not quite as um, difficult, but this is the one that we really need to help with a planning grant to figure out the feasibility of it. Um, but don't don't take that as if we're not exploring any other options at the same time. Robert, uh, Vic, with the um, the location of the town offices be within I mean within the building be appropriate under this uh, as as an option under these um, this planning grant. Yeah, I think that would, you know as I said, there, we have a catch all paragraph where other things beyond the the um, defined scope that we've already talked about could be included and would be within the scope. So yes, we could take a look at that. And if that's something that the, you know, the select board agrees that we should uh, look at, you know, we could certainly. Having a daytime it. presence down there, um, you know, Monday through Friday is a good idea. Town offices be there, possibly a council on aging office would relocate down there. And um, some other people have responded that they're interested in office space as well, but I don't think I'll mention them in the purpose of the hearing because it's also open, but all of that will go into the planning grant. Um, Char, you're muted, yep. I'm curious uh, to know um, if, if the grant were to be granted, um, has the committee uh, already identified appropriate um, consultants and how many consultants would you need and is the grant sufficient to pay that many consultants? Yeah, the, uh, we were given a list of uh, recognized consultants from the, from the granting agency from the, the Department of Community uh, Development um, and we talked with the, the rep uh, from that department about some uh, strengths of different consultants. Um, we uh, have not vetted that list yet. Uh, and we know that there are at least two other programs uh, in the state uh, that have achieved, have acquired these grants and have used consultants. So we have some people to call on the, uh, the project in Bridgewater and where they converted a, a school building to a multi-purpose facility like we're talking about. And also in Wilmington, did the same thing with a former high school building, uh, which has been a very successful venture. They got both the planning grant uh, and an implementation grant from the same source that we're pursuing. So yeah, there. I mean, I've, I've come to learn there's this whole sort of ecosystem of consultants and uh, funds out there that uh, you know it's it's new to a lot of us and we're we're learning about it. But yes, there are consultants out there. And in terms of the cost, um, the um, uh, uh, consultant on loan to us from Vermont Council on Rural Development, uh, Alyssa Johnson, 
uh, shared with us a project that she worked on when she was the economic director, development director in Waterbury, uh, where it's somewhat similar program and the cost of that consulting engagement was $41,000. Uh, so we think we're, we think we're okay uh, as far as the work that we wanna have done. It, it might take more than uh, one single consultant because the different types of work we're looking to have done, you know, we're talking about facility assessment versus business planning versus fundraising, uh, uh, grantsmanship kinds of assessments. So it's probably going to, I'm sure it's going to take it more than one and, you know, maybe three different consultants uh, to get all the work done. Um, Jeff, get part, you had your hand up. You're muted. Well, I was, I was just going to point out, and I think Nick did, that uh, we have had assistance and support, professional support from the Vermont Council on Rural Development through Alyssa in reviewing this uh, and putting together this grant application as well as thinking through next steps. And the feedback has been that this is a strong proposal. We've had positive feedback, just, just the FYI. Um, is there anything that Robert haven't touched on or, or Robert Gardner, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I want to uh, play off of what, uh, what Frank and Patty said relating to this, to this grant, uh, from a pessimist standpoint, five out of seven of your items are never going to make any money. This is my own pessimist. And so, uh, at some point, if that were true, uh, we would need to be able to, to shift our point of view outside of the box that we've defined. This, I think, is, is what these guys were talking about. We're going to have to come up with something else, because I think that it, it is essential to try to find a way to, to, to have that building, that large property in the middle of our town within the town's control. I think that's really important. I'm just very pessimistic about this particular approach. So I don't know, and, and maybe Vic can speak to this, if there's enough flexibility in the study that, that the kind of thing Frank is talking about, the kind of thing that Annie is talking about, or, or something hasn't been thought of yet, uh, Patty, uh, we hasn't been thought of yet because we're not thinking in those terms. We've defined kind of a narrow box for this thing. And uh, I don't know if, if there's flexibility within this grant to, to go outside of the box, uh, or if that's just a whole nother effort and, and a whole nother conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe there is. And uh, you know, again, we, we intentionally included sort of a, uh, you know, and all other category within the proposal so that we have the flexibility to look at other things. Because, you know, once, as we get into this more deeply, I think it's likely that other ideas are going to surface um, and the consultants who worked around the state may point to a program in uh, Wilmington or someplace else and say, why don't you try this? In fact, I, I happen to know that the program in Wilmington where they converted a high school building, they have a combination of for-profit and non-profit businesses in the building. So for example, they have their supervisor union offices there. There's a, there's a uh, karate school, <laughs> there's, a, there's a bakery shop, and there's a, you know, a variety of other uh, social service programs in the building. So yeah, I think there are some other ways to do this uh, and you know, hopefully get all the programs we're talking about and more. But, uh, but uh, to answer your, back to your question, Rob, I believe, yes, there is flexibility to look at other ideas we just haven't thought of. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I'm, Pat mentioned tomorrow at nine. Tomorrow at nine, we're meeting with a developer to look at affordable housing. Don't get apoplexy. What's the word? Apoplexy. apoplexy. Dick. <laughs> I'm not advocating that we turn this uh, classroom component into uh, affordable housing, but it's one of the things that we need to look at as a part of this grant and identify things that we think could, can work and things that we know or think can't work. We, we would uh, be really amiss if we didn't uh, explore that because right now there's so much money coming down to provide affordable housing. So yeah. Patty set that up and that's tomorrow morning at nine. But that feasibility, if that's a if that's a green light, that will be a parallel feasibility study. In the end, the town's gonna vote. The town's gonna decide. We are about getting information to the town, informing the town, and then the town is gonna decide, well, we want this, or we want this, or we want something else, you know. Uh, the select board is 
totally, totally firm and united that um, that it's got to go to the town for a vote. So the more information, the better, and that's what this grant is all about. Pat. I, I think maybe I'm, I'm feeling we're, we're, we're getting tied up in, in what we're saying here and, and uh, everybody is, has got all ears. Um, uh, all in all, um, if we want to take a step back, what were we stepping back 25 years um, to the group of people that um, said, let's do something with Pierce Hall. <laughs> um, that I believe was a 20 year project. Um, this hopefully by no means is, is that type of project. <laughs> but if there is a very positive note to spin on this, um, that wasn't supposed to be possible um, to take a building that was built in the very early 1900s and bring it up to the code of the year 20, 2010 or whatever. Um, there was a lot of naysayers back in those days too. Um, so the one thing that I, I feel as though when I look at that process is that this is a pretty determined valley um, and uh, I got a lot of gumption. There's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of faith and um, a lot of depending on each other. So if there is a chance of this being successful, um, I would like to say that that type of attitude is still in our valley and that it will be utilized and we're going to take this as long as we can to the end to determine whether it's going to be a success or not. Uh, we'll, we won't quit on this. Um, I certainly hope not. Um, so um, I, I think it's always willing to take a shot take it to the end, and then we can make a really educated decision on what this building should do for our community in the end. Robert? Uh, uh, I would just like to second that, that no, not only Pierce Hall, but 35 years ago, there was community care, talked about um, uh, it was a, um, had a much more narrow scope of that they looked at this whole this hotel that was there and had a vision of having um, uh, seen senior um, uh, living there. And that came through. Again, that was many years in the making. Uh, lots of planning grants, lot, lots of lots of community work, and a lot of determination. Catherine? I want to follow up on what Patty and Robert just said, because <laughs> Jeannie Levitan has been working on our committees as well. And um, part of the vision of the Arts and Learning Center is to not 100% be building-based, but to be campus-based so that as the programming is developed, we are hoping that the programming will benefit both Pierce Hall and what goes on in the, uh, in the high school. I think that's a really important point. And we have gotten a letter from uh, Park House uh, totally supporting this. And we're due to get one from Johnson Care Home as well. Those are smaller facilities without the ability to really you know, expand on activities. And they, uh, both organizations uh, feel that this would totally uh, broaden what they can offer to their residents as well. All right. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to add to the discussion or, um, um, I, one piece of, um, housekeeping, um, someone joined in on the phone that seven, six, seven, four, two, nine, five, could you identify yourself for the, the records? If you heard me. Nope. Um, okay, that's. Uh, I guess I can call that number later and figure out who that is. Um, all right. I think, I think it's. Uh, it might be Harv Downs. Okay, um, we'll figure that out. Cool. I looked in the community phone book. The reverse lookup for the phone numbers. <laughs> um, Dune, I have a quick question. 
Yep. Um, on the um, the copy of the like agenda or whatever that Julie sent me for this meeting, at the bottom it says. Um, so is there a separate meeting after this? It says special remote select board meeting following public hearing, and but it's so there's there's something. No, this is the special meeting that we're in right now, I believe. Yeah. Okay, it's something about a motion to contract with Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission. Right. For the, the select board, we are ha we are also having what is considered to be a special meeting to uh, bring forth a motion uh, to contract with Two Rivers so that they can assist us in writing that grant. Oh, and okay. A, a resolution in order for us to apply for the grant. So the, those two are very closely associated with what we're talking about. Okay, but so it's not really a special separate meeting. No, I think, uh, did you, are you gonna make that motion right now, Pat? Um, do we, you have the, the have motion? Nancy, do you have a point of order here? Well, I think that you had a public meeting, which you, which you, opened and I think you have to adjourn the public meeting. Okay, and and then open to select, but okay, yeah. make that, all right, because yeah, this just, is just the I just want to add that, that, that they will also administrate the funds of the grant. Okay. And they've been written into the budget and the budget is also on the town website for anybody who wants to look at that. All right, so at this point, unless anyone has anything else they'd like to add to this, um, this hearing, I'd move to close this public hearing and then um, open up the, a special select board meeting to um, approve this application to Two Rivers. Pat, you have the verbiage on that. Do you want to make a motion on that? Um, I think Vic might have it. Who has, who has this? <laughs> um, I don't have any specific, uh, but I can uh, just summarize uh, motion. It would be a motion to... Uh, retain uh, Two Rivers Wadakichi Regional Commission uh, as the grant administrator for this right. grant if it is uh, approved. And, um, and there's a fee of $7,000 that's been quoted and that would come out of the grant funds. That would not come out of town funds. Yeah. So I move what he said. <laughs> I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That's and then the a resolution. Um, the resolution, I believe, is that the town of Rochester is applying for a grant for a feasibility study for the high school building. And I think it is as simple as that. We just need well, to be on record saying we approve that. No, actually, I think it, it, it's a little more specific than that. And I'll see if I can find it in the instructions. Uh, So do we need to vote this in tonight or can we do it on Monday where we get it all figured out to make sure the motion is correct? But the resolution, well, let's see if Vic can yeah. come up with it yeah. right Let now. Let me say uh, you're in the public hearing. Yeah, I'm looking for... Uh, we stay here? Resolution. I mean, this is, yeah, we're not, this doesn't have to be executive well, session. We're making a resolution that we've all been you know about a subject we've all been talking about i don't think we need to do this and you can you don't have to stay here but no. you can't yeah it's like if they can come up with that I yeah think. i think i can i'm just yeah yeah coming down to the right section of the instructions i think that's page on 16 at the top here it is it's on page 14 oh 14 oh wait i'm sorry Okay, here, here, let me just read this. The municipality should uh, select the most appropriate resolution for the grant application. Uh, the resolution is to certify that it, one, possesses legal authority to apply for the grant and to administer the program. Two, applies for a grant under the terms and conditions of said program and agrees hereby to enter into certifications and assurances. Three, has a duly adopted and current municipal plan or community development plan and that the project is consistent with the plan. Four, has received documentation from the Regional Planning Commission that the project is consistent with the regional plan, which you have. 
has authorized a designated person to be the contact person to provide on behalf of applicant all documents and information necessary for completion of the application and to provide such coordination as may be necessary for the application. That would be to Rivers. Um, it is understood that if the application is funded, the receipt of the funds as federal funds passed through the state of Vermont may require that an audit of the applicant be conducted under the provision of the Single Audit Act as amended and that uh, Vermont Council, Vermont Community Development Program funds may be used to fund only a limited portion of the audit cost. Um, excuse me, Vic. Yes. I can't, there's no way I could have written I'll, that I'll, out. I'll copy it. I'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah, we'll send it to you. <laughs> Is there any way you, I was, that one of you could email me that just so I, that I can I will. have. I'll do that. I'll do that as soon as we're Thank done. you very much. I sure. appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Is that it? Well, I, That's Pat, it. Excuse me. Patty confused me. Did she say that Troc is handling the grant funds or the town? The They're town is a fine, but yeah, the Two Rivers is going to um, be doing the, the legwork and the, the logistics of, of, you know, the paperwork aspect of it. Yeah. So or the, this resolution that Vic just read, is that something that the board is, is approving? Or? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The, the, right. Yeah. The, the select board would need to approve that in order for the um, applicant to be uh, viable. Right, right. So can we move to uh, approve what he just read? Because <laughs> I can't re restate that very quickly myself. No. <laughs> I move that we adopt the resolution as stated by Vic. Yeah, I would second that. Uh, I favor it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank there you. it is on public record, right on your computer screen. <laughs> and uh, and th thank you for offering to send it to me. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's the way I can write it all down. <laughs> so um, onward in the, the quest for um, information and understanding and, and um, all, everyone's efforts is, is, are much appreciated here. Um, Thank you to everybody for all the hard work you've put into it. I, I very much appreciate it myself just as, as a Rochester resident. Well, as Dick said, we love, we love this community. Yeah, It's about love. Yeah. Well, I mean, I had three kids that went all the way through the schools there and graduated and it broke my heart when the high school closed down, but I understood the reasons, I guess, for that. So now I, I'm very I'm very glad to see that there are ways that we can use the building um, for good purposes now. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we've um, taken care of all the business that we came here to do tonight. And um, not quite dark out, we're done. So <laughs> um, thank you all and happy spring. And um, happy, we'll keep posting. All right. For all the good work that you're all doing. Thank you to everybody. Right. See you Monday night. Good 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 night.